Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I see some of our colleagues are out there getting last call drinks, and they'll be in in a second. So, welcome everybody in. Um, the book "Opportunity Knocking" by Lorianne Larocco is something that you should all buy. It is right outside here, and I don't even think you should buy one. I think you should buy like three. You know, even though the holidays have passed, there's always a good occasion. And this is a very practical book. This is a book that everybody needs to read and that everybody needs to understand. And hopefully we'll get um, to some of the understanding and some of the lessons um, in Laurie Ann's book today. Um, first, uh, if anybody's tweeting, we're, we're at CSIS and at Laurie Ann Larocco and at H. Andrew Schwartz. So please feel free to live tweet from the event. Um, we'll have a, a video recording of this on demand on our website later, so if anybody wants to refer back to it and share it with their friends, please feel free. But uh, I'd like to welcome you all, and I'd especially like to welcome my friend Lorianne Larocco, who I've worked with for years. Thank you. Um, this is a fantastic book, like I said, and um, for those of you who don't know Lorianne, she's known as the, the producer with the trillion dollar Rolodex. Not billion, trillion, T. And that's because over the last 14 years, she's been, I would say, inarguably, the most important person at CNBC because she's the person who decides who's going to come on and who's not, and who is interesting enough to come on, and who's really newsworthy. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you know, a lot, you know, when you watch television today, I, you know, I, I, I was telling somebody earlier this afternoon, you know, it's really hard to watch the three major cable networks right now because one of them's covering the Malaysian plane endlessly. Yeah. The, the, the other two are sort of lost in a political fight most of the day between each other. And so what, what do you watch? Well, if you really want real news, go to CNBC. You'll get the yeah. financial news, but you'll also get international news and domestic news that really matters. And like I said, um, Lorianne is one of the real, really important people there who make um, such great TV every day. Um, this book's meant to instruct the reader as how to find opportunity regardless of the current stage of their career. Um, a concluding section in each chapter um, is a page from my notebook, it, and it lists um, the, the case studies, uh, whether it's uh, uh, David Rubenstein or Alan Mulally or people like that in the book, um, uh, Harold Hamm. Um, it gives their own personal insights as to you know, the rules to live by, their mantras, their life lessons. Um, Lori Ann then relates their message to the reader in separate sections for business owners and managers, for employees, and for aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, the conclusion crisscrosses the seven layers uh, of, of the opportunity pyramid, which we'll get to in a second, and, uh, and the business leaders themselves. Um, but the book's main purpose is to show that the successful use of opportunity can ultimately be, be applied to any person, by any person, at any stage of their career and any career path. So with that, I, I, um, Lori, did, did you want to give a few opening remarks and then I'll, I'll just interview you or should we just kick it off right away? We can just kick it right away. All off. right. Well, the first thing I want to ask you is, is you know, one quality of your book that, com that, imme that immediately jumps out to me is your immense passion for journalism. Um, you know, is this book, in the book, there's, there's uh, you know, was there one reason why you decide, decided at any particular point that I have to do this book and I have to tell these stories? This is uh, Opportunity Knocking is actually my third book. And uh, I wanted to write the book because when I go around the country and I speak to folks uh, with my other books, everybody always asks, how do people think? What do they do? What are the strategies that they employ? And it dawned on me. I was stuck in the airport in Miami. Uh, it was snowing up north, so I couldn't get back. And I'm sitting there, sitting on the floor, and I'm reviewing like, all these questions. And it dawned on me that all the strategies, no matter what industry folks are in, they're identical. And I said, I've got to do something like this because it dawned on me that I use these strategies, and I'm a journalist and I'm a mom of three. So I'm like, if I use these strategies and I think I'm successful, and I know like Alan Mulally of Ford and, and all these other folks, and they use the same strategies, I think people need to know. And I think there's a leader in all of us, and it's just a matter of us tapping into our strengths. Great. The book, the book is about seizing opportunity. opportunity. Um, one of the really original things that I, I find fascinating about this book is 
Florianne's created something that she calls the Opportunity Pyramid. Annie, do you want to call up the Opportunity Pyramid? Oh, it's already up. Okay, good. So here's the Opportunity Pyramid. Lorianne, do you want to walk us through what the Opportunity Pyramid is? Sure. Um, I'm very visual because I'm a television producer. And I think it's always easier for people to actually see something versus somebody just bloviating and you're trying to picture it in your mind. Um, every layer of the pyramid, there are seven, as you can see. It's a strategy. Now, also with the pyramid, it's not that it's very linear and you're gonna be in one strategy, say for six months, one for a year, et cetera. It is all based on your own timetable. And what I found the most important thing you need to do if you wanted to find opportunity is to know yourself. How can you distinguish between an, a good opportunity and a bad one if you don't know your strengths and weaknesses? And it's very hard because you have to be very honest with yourself. And that's what all these leaders that I deal with they're very honest about their abilities and what they need to work on. So that's first and foremost uh, what you need to do. And within there, that's, that's a really big foundation. It's is very large for you because that's where you develop your culture of the company that you're trying to create, your mantra. And, and really, you start thinking about your end game. You really need to know where you want to go in order to start. You can't make it up as you go along. I have never found a leader that kind of makes it up. They literally have a plan. So then after that, you build your knowledge. And that kind of stems back to the foundation where you know your strengths and weaknesses. You, you want to build up what you, you are good at. And you want to work on things that you might not be so strong in. And then it leads into defining your opportunity and sticking with it. And again, that all goes back to the very beginning where you use your knowledge and you use your definition of yourself and your strengths and weaknesses and you come up with your game plan. And what I have found all good leaders, no matter what business climate that they're in, whatever cycle we're in, whatever government regulation is coming or not coming, that plan is in place and they can continue working on it in any business environment. Can government leaders apply this to their work as well? Most definitely. I was actually just uh, recently interviewed about that very topic. Um, I, I think um, politicians can use this based on going very to the very beginning about who are they? Why were they elected to office? They were elected by their constituents. They're not here for themselves. They're really here for America. And I think what you're seeing is because we've got the gridlock in Washington right now, people are making it part of them. Like when you look at, like, um, I, I know Dick Armey very well. Mm -hmm. And he says that one of the biggest failures of the Tea Party is they became what they are against. They, it's all about them. I mean, look what happened with, uh, with Senator Cruz. He made it about him. And I think that we have to get back to basics, be a leadership, and like if you're a leader in business or you're a leader in politics, you have to realize why you are here, define why you're here, and you have to make sure that all of your actions go back to your mantra. They go back to the greater good. And I think that is one of the biggest things that I think politicians can learn from this pyramid. You know, it's interesting because as we, you mentioned the polarization in Washington. One of the, the, the things that we're seeing often at CSIS is that um, really the things, the things, when things really need to get done, they're not really done in the government, they're done in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Most of the real innovation is done in the private sector. And so therefore, government is starting to partner more yes. with the private sector. In our, in our organization, we have several business leaders on our board, people like um, Jim McNerney of, of Boeing, uh, Mutar Kent of Coca-Cola, Rex Tillerson of Exxon, John Hess of Hess Oil, uh, John Hammergren of McKesson. And so people, like, we, we considerably learn, uh, considerably and often as, as we can, we learn from them and ask their advice um, on how to do different things in terms of national security, foreign policy, global challenges. We're even working with um, Chevron on a development project right now where we're studying how development works as soft power. We always sit around in these meetings with our, our, our CEO friends on our board, and we're fascinated by them. In your book, you detail some of the really fascinating CEOs who are out there. Can you tell us about some of them and what makes them so interesting? When I came up with the pyramid, I, wanted, I always think about who's going to be the right person to be the example. Um, Harold Tam, 
of uh, continental resources. He is America's richest oil man, and he has a high school education. He is one of 13 children. Parents were sharecroppers. And uh, back in the olden days, he didn't go to school regular, like September through June. He worked on the farm. So he only went to school during the wintertime. And the kids had to work. So I wanted to pick him because he's extremely successful. He learned as he went along. He, was, um, he met by chance somebody in the oil industry, and it really left an impression on him. He was like, you know what? I want to do that. Did he care that he had no money and they had a one-bedroom apartment, a one-bedroom house with 13 children? No. He didn't look at I can't. It was I can. So I thought he would be a wonderful example to kind of motivate people. Um, also, Steve Case of uh, AOL, of course. Um, Steve has reached the apex of success several times and has come also crashing down. And I thought it'd be wonderful to have him in to kind of show that, yes, you can learn from your mistakes. And I thought that is something that everybody here in this room can relate to. Um, when it comes to um, execution, paying attention to those details, which is the second to the top of you know, the pyramid, I wanted to choose David Rubenstein of Carlisle. Um, I've been fortunate. I've known David, oh goodness, for many, many years. And the way that he has created Carlisle it's amazing. He creates what's called the One Carlisle Culture. And it doesn't matter if you go to his office here, or in Tokyo, or in London. They are identical. All these leaders have these people that come in, like everyone that, that's their employee. They all believe in the same thing. They believe in their mantra. They believe in their game plan. And they've all said that they have lost, quote, good people that are good on paper because they didn't fit. So I love how I can kind of weave in what they've learned and their mistakes to kind of show to you that they're just like you and I. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Like Warren Buffett is a regular person. He puts his pants on one leg at a time. Um, leadership is not based on a bank account. It's based on within, and it's based with qualities. And that, that's why I was trying to like focus on certain folks like that. Well, we certainly know that David Rubenstein's successful. All you have to do is go. Uh, down to Annapolis Harbor, and, and about half the people who own boats there worked for David at one time or another, so we know he's done pretty well. <laughs> but how did a guy like Harold Hamm, who, had, who, didn't have a, who wasn't educated, who came from a very humble background, how did he outsmart his competition? What, what was it about him that, became the, that he was able to become the richest oil man in the world? He marketed himself. He was a consumer. He took it as, if I need to buy oil, what would I want a company do for me? Because remember, he didn't have any money. And he, he was very simple. And it's, it's like that aha moment. He said, if I, could, if I could offer the same service or better service at a cheaper price, I'm going to get the competition. And it sound, that, I mean, that's pretty basic knowledge, right? I mean, it's not like you're inventing the, you know, this new invention. Um, it's common sense, and I think sometimes um, the solution that you're looking for is right in front of your nose, and we're always so deep looking, and you know, sometimes you just have to kind of wake up and see it's right there, and it just shows you how basic being successful is, and what he did was he would learn from everybody out on the field, and he took selective college courses eventually when he could afford it to uh, get the geology background. But it's very basic. It was just kind of relating to the, the person that he was serving. So the other side of this is, is, and you mentioned someone like Steve Case who's reached the pinnacle but has also come crashing down. Yeah. What are some of the, the things that you found that um, people tend to get stalled at along this? And what keeps them from achieving a pinnacle? I think one of the biggest levels I think that's very hard is a combination of staying the course and the execution. Because once you're really high and when you get through the passion part, when you're on the road to success, it can be fairly intoxicating. And a lot of people, especially in today's instantaneous environment, people want it now. And they don't realize that it could take time. And I think sometimes when you start getting successful, you get that buzz. Like, oh, they're up and coming. They're the new one. I think people get intoxicated 
and they start believing in the hype. And that's when arrogance can, can set in. And arrogance, I think, is one of the biggest downfalls of any corporate leader uh, because they make mistakes, because they believe that they can't do anything wrong. So I think you, know, you, you still have to be passionate. You have to recognize still everything that's going on. And you have to stay that course, and you have to execute. Is it that their instincts somehow get blurred as they get more successful, or is it something, you, know, you mentioned arrogance. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I tend to think that the people who are successful um, in this world are, really trust their instincts. Is it, is, does it become a matter of them trusting their instincts too much? No, I, I think your instinct, for the most part, is always right. You always go with your gut. You really do. Um, if something doesn't seem right, if you're getting that weird vibe from somebody, you normally, your, your gut is pretty much like your, your homing mm -hmm. device, if you will. I think what happens is um, the arrogance do, does cloud their judgment in terms of thinking that they're infallible. Interesting. Well, what, on the other side of that is what are, what are all the essential traits that all successful businessmen need to navigate this pyramid? Well, first and foremost, they have to be honest mm -hmm. um, with themselves, with the people that they hire. Um, they have to have the passion because you have to truly believe in what you are doing. And you have to surround yourself, your team. It doesn't matter if you're a small business owner or a big CEO. You want the people around you to further believe in what you guys are doing, your greater good, because it's going to be tough. So I think passion is important. And I think just constantly learning, that thirst for knowledge, is also equally important. Those are three big characteristics, I think, that all good leaders share. Tell us a little bit. Somebody who really stuck out to me was Ralph Schlossstein, um, the head of uh, Evercore Partners. And one of the things he said um, really resonated with me. It's a sports analogy. A great leader is like a, a, a great point guard. They try to make everyone around them a better performer. And you, here in Washington, we've just seen this because our wizards are you know, coming out of the dark and into the light because <laughs> our point guard is making everybody around him better. Mm -hmm. So w tell me about Ralph Schlossstein and, and, and how he came to that and, and who he is. and what you know, He really jumps out of your book at, to yeah. me as somebody who's pretty, pretty special. Well, he, um, he used to work in Washington. He used to work in Treasury back in the 70s. Um, as you said, he is the head of Evercore, which is one of the largest private equity firms, um, you know, next to, of course, Carlisle. Ralph is a people person. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Altman, former Deputy Treasury Secretary who formed Carlisle, is the one who hired Ralph. And he really gets to know people. And he truly cares about the people that work for him. And he's all about, like you said, teamwork. It's all about being on the same team, being on the same page, um, letting you work to your strengths, and, and you know, kind of compiling and, and collaborating. And it's funny, because you mentioned the teamwork. Every CEO that I talk to, like in that book, they all mention teamwork in one way or another, be it Ron Kraszewski of Steeple Financial, uh, Steve Kay said that one of the biggest things, uh, one of the biggest positives um, that an entrepreneur needs to have in their camp, if you will, is a, is a is team. It's not I. We go together. And no one goes alone. So how did you know? One of the things he says here is, this is Ralph Schlossstein. Um, there's always going to be a new normal, and every business has to adapt in order to to continue to be successful. So how do you do that? How do you make everybody better around you? How do you adapt? And how do you lead a team? And how do you uh, uh, execute really good teamwork? He seems to me the pinnacle of all yeah. that. Um, I, it's their culture. It's their culture. You have to be nimble. Um, you know, Especially after the financial crisis, it's pretty obvious you have to be nimble in order to uh, succeed. Um, they don't believe in being like the deer in the headlights. And I think if you have a culture in place where you have your set mantra, all your decisions go back to that mantra. Mantra It goes back to your goal and your end game. Um, based on those two things, it enables you that no matter what, it, what part of the cycle you're in, you can achieve success because you have your roadmap, if you will. So that's why he's always saying that no matter what environment we're in, we can still make money. Sometimes we'll make more money. Sometimes we might, you know, 
because in the private equity, as you know, there are cycles. But if you stay to your core values and everyone's on the same page, you'll be able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Another fascinating case study is um, Alan Mulally of Ford. Yes. Who I saw on TV today. Yes, uh, that little news that he made. Just a little. Just a um, little. But you know, one of the things that, that struck me about him is different from some of the other leaders is the talks about a compelling vision, yes. about creating a compelling vision and sticking to that vision and sticking to that plan. Tell us about your, your experience um, with Alan. I mean, another thing he says, you don't wait for an opportunity. It doesn't come to you when you're just sitting in a room. Mm -hmm. You know, we, this is somebody who really turned around oh, yeah. one of the, the most American of all American things. Um, tell us about him. Alan is just larger than life. Uh, what you see on TV, he is like that in person. Um, the people that work for him, I have friends that work for Ford. They just worship him. This positive energy, he truly believes in what he is doing. Um, when he took over Ford, as we all know, it was a mishmash of everything. Right. He was looking for inspiration, and it came in the form of a 1927 ad opening the highways to all mankind. It was his aha moment. Uh, so much so that I loved it that I actually put it in the book because sometimes the most simplest things are, like I said, are staring you right in the face. And he went back to basics. And based on that one central vision, that compelling vision, because it really is compelling because it's so simple, every decision that he has made at Ford goes right back to that very thing, opening the highways to all mankind. And how do they do it? Be it with green vehicles, they sliced and diced all the, you know, the, the cars that, that didn't fit the Ford brand. Everything goes back to that. And they have weekly meetings on Thursdays. It's, it really is a culture of inclusion and empowerment. Um, that's why um, I'm actually writing a piece about you know, Kelly stepping in that I, I personally believe that I think it's gonna, the, the culture of goodness is going to continue because Kelly was a key part with Alan in reformatting Ford. And I think now that they know who they are, they define themselves, they have their mission statement, they have that compelling vision and the passion behind it because every, every person from the floor all the way up to the corner office, they all believe in that. So I think that the success will follow. So what does he mean when he says, quote, you never want an improvement to pass you by because you need that improvement every month, every year in order to continue on your path to continuously improving and deliver that compelling vision. You, you want to be the best that you can be, and you can't be stagnant. It's like going back to Ralph Slostein, talking about you have to be nimble. You have to be able to um, kind of go with the flow. And if you're a leader, you always want to strive. You always want to be one step ahead of the competition, because if you get complacent and you kind of stay the way you are, you're not going to be innovating. Um, you're going to fall behind. You're going to pass that baton, if you will. So Alan's always looking for ways, be it a better engine, a better design, um, making lighter weight vehicles, as we all know that they recently put out. So that's, what, that's a big challenge. You know, you've got to constantly perfect yourself. Interesting. So now back to Steve Case. So Steve Case may be, the, the, one of the things that's interesting about the book, too, is there's cross themes <laughs> that pick up on each other. So one with Steve K that Steve Case brings out is, is you, you, you can't lead alone. You can't do it alone. How does that square with the pyramid, with the overarching philosophy that you're trying to get across in the book? Well, I think it really, the, you can't go alone, and it starts with your foundation. I mean, of course, an idea starts with yourself. You start a small business, it's, it's you, of course. But... You know when they say like your friends are a reflection of yourself? Well, the people that you hire are a reflection of you. And you can't go it alone. And you know, Steve Case, when he, when he was at GameLine, he left, a, he left a Fortune 500 company to start this new venture. <clears throat> and when he got there, he realized the company was going down. It was going bankrupt. First meeting he ever went to. So you can imagine what he's thinking as he's sitting in the board meeting going, oh gosh, what did I do? But he found like-minded people, and then they created AOL because they believed in that compelling vision of social media. So I, you know, when you, when you talk about Steve, it goes right to the very beginning of your foundation. 
And the same thing with building your knowledge, because if we work together, we're going to collaborate. You're going to know my strengths and my weaknesses, and I'm going to know yours. And what happens is if you have that good culture, you have that good teamwork, you're going to complement each other. So you know that's also another way that teamwork will work, as well as to find the opportunity and the passion, because you're all going to rely on each other. In tough times, you're going to need somebody to be there, to kind of encouragement. You're going to encourage each other. I mean, it's, nothing is worse than working in, a, in an office space where people are digging at each other, talking behind people's back, th those cancers, as I like to call them. You want to have that really good culture, that good environment where you're like, Andrew, great job today. It's going to make you feel good. Or, you know, vice versa. So I think even like, and even going up to like the thinking ahead, world domination, you've got to work as a team. You got to all keep your eyes open to see what the competition is doing. And one set, like what I would say, 10, set, 10 sets of eyes are a lot better than just one. Because a lot of times, if you're so insular and you think you're the end all be all and you're arrogant, you're going to be shutting yourself down from the people around you. And I think a lot of times you need those other people to kind of bounce off ideas mm -hmm. as well as to see that give and take where it's going to spark something. You never know where it's going to lead you. Well, I can tell you one thing. I wouldn't be able to do anything without my staff here. And I tell them that all the time. Um, and I think that goes for you know, all the programming here at CSIS. It takes, especially in our new building where we have, the scale has changed. We, if, we, if we're not working as a team, we're failing. And so we think about that all the time. Now, speaking of failure, there's another side of this. And David Rubenstein points it out pretty well. He says, if you're afraid of making a mistake, and losing money, then you can't be in the deals world. Absolutely true. You, you have to be able to take calculated risk. There's a difference between carelessness and careful risk. When you, when you do your calculated risk, that's when you go back to the foundation, you go back to your points of what you want to achieve, and every decision that you make goes back to the overall mission of what you're trying to do. But in the end, you have to be able to risk something, because how are you going to grow? But, he's, but it's very important to stress that you have to make the risk, but it's got to be that calculated risk. He also talks about time as an important factor. I think one of the things that we all have such a, a struggle with every day is managing our time. And you know, you're a mother, you're, you're a professional, you, you have a husband, you have a whole life going on, and you work really difficult hours at CNBC. And you know, as I know from my past experience, TV is not the easiest thing. It's not rocket science, but it's not the easiest thing to, to make work every day. How do, how do you factor time in, um, in terms of success? It's extremely important. Um, well, I live by the clock because I'm on television. So if you're not there at 7.50 for your hit, I'm screwed. So um, <laughs> I, I, I really care about the time. Um, I think what you need to do is like you put that pen to paper and it's about uh, constructing and prioritizing what you need to do. The other thing with like private equity with David and one of the things he really um, focused on, as you all know, he's a huge history buff um, and has done a lot for our nation in regards to like the rebuilding of the Washington Monument and the Magna right. Carta and all this. Um, we're very short term now, be it Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, he, he, you know, he's like, how many folks could actually sit down and read War and Peace now? Because they, they don't have time. You're always moving and going. When it comes to investing, particularly with him, you, he's more of a, like a buy and hold, if you will. I mean, like the average, time, the average time frame he holds a company is three to five years. And in the world of hedge funds where they're, you know, trading stuff left and right and they're you know, blasting off emails to try to bully their way to get whatever they want from the company. It's a very different approach. And even when you talk to Ralph Slostein or be it a Ron Krzyzewski, it takes time to get to that goalpost. You have to be able to put the time in to make sure you focus on those details in order to achieve your goal. So it's, it's, it's two for in terms of investing and also like that knowledge and time and prioritizing. Fuel your passion seems to me to be a really big part of this. Um, one of my colleagues once asked David Rubenstein, 
what do you do for fun? And he looked at my colleague as if he were nuts. What do you mean what I, I travel 300 days a year and I achieve success, that's what's fun. Um, so that's his passion and that's why he's, one of the reasons why he's done so well. Yeah. Let's talk about passion in terms of deciding what you're gonna do and being really good at it. I think that's something I talk to my staff about all the time. Definitely, um, it doesn't matter, even outside of the individuals that are in this book, uh, be it Wilbur Ross, uh, Richard Lefrac, you know, Wilbur's in his 80s, he still travels around the world, making his deals, he bought the Bank of Ireland, you know. Um, he loves what he does. And I think, you know, we work so long in our life, we, we better be doing something that we like, because, you know, you don't want to have a job. You want to have a career, or you want to really love it. And, and I work crazy hours, and I've had the White House call my house during dinner time, and the kids are like, tell Obama's people to you know, hang up, we're eating dinner. <laughs> you know, it's, you know it's, it's a very time consuming, but I absolutely love what I do. And I think if you love it, you're going to be even good at it. So that's why I always say, like the very beginning of the pyramid, what are you good at? Because chances are, if you're really good at something, you're going to excel in it. And you just have to figure out a way of um, where should you go? Like, how do you use your talents, be it in an organization or you create your own company? If you're a manager, you're passionate about it, you want to exude that passion, you want to, you want to um, you know, make your own, you want, you want to encourage your own employees to have that passion because positivity as well as negativity is infectious. And I think that's one of the, one of the biggest things in terms of kind of getting you through all those levels of the pyramid because you have to be happy. So at the end of the day, it, it, is it all about money for these guys? Or is it about success? Or is it about achievement? Or it, I don't think it's about money because if you look at um, a lot of them, like with their mantras and their life le lessons, it's all about giving back. Mm. All of them have some sort of essence of giving back. God bless you. Um, they want to get, I mean, yes, they're successful. Yes, they have beautiful homes and paintings and things like that. But all of them give back to either charity mm -hmm. or society. And they're humble. They say please and thank you. For instance, like David Rubenstein and um, uh, their president, I was talking to them once at the Ron Barron conference. And they were talking about how they take notice if they are walked to the door or not. I always do that. When I have guests that come on Squawk Box and my guest co-hosts, I walk them to the door. I walk them out of the building. I never thought twice about it. But apparently, that's a really big deal, and a lot of businessmen do not do that. They look for common courtesy. They look for manners. And if you were a, you know, a, a greedy a top one percenter, that doesn't care, that's just a billionaire, you wouldn't care about manners. But all of those individuals and the, one, and the business leaders that I deal with all do. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot about a person because bottom line, like I said before, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it depends on the value of the individual. And that's what they look for as well when they're hiring people, is the value. And we saw this week, just in the news, one billionaire, American billionaire who really seems to have no values. Yeah. Donald Sterling from uh, the Los Angeles yeah. Clippers. I mean, we saw, so incredibly successful guy financially, but he certainly seems to be completely bankrupt, morally, morally bankrupt. and socially and yeah. in his own life. So how can that be? That's not success. No, no one would define that as success. That is not successful. Like I said, success is not based on a bank account. When you look back at life, when you're 90 years old or whatever, what are you going to leave this world? What is your legacy? Are you going to be a nasty miser? Or are you going to make the world a better place based on what you have done, be it at your job or at your company or even as a, uh, you know, what you contribute to society as a family person? That's what defines success because you have to look at yourself in the mirror every day. That's true. And one, one of the case studies that I, I wanted to talk about, but I, I do want to go to your questions. So think of questions. I'm going to go to you in just a minute. But the, the women who started Blog Her, yes. tell us about them and about their story. Oh, they it's are a fascinating phenomenal. story. I love them. Um, there are three women. 
um, Lisa, Lisa Stone, Elisa Camahor Page, and Jory Desjardins. Uh, Lisa Stone was a single mother. Uh, she had an inf it was, and at the time, her son was an infant. And she was a CNN correspondent. And she realized, you know, I've got a baby now. I can't be traveling all over the world. I've got to find a different job because I want to raise my kid. So she um, looked at her strengths and said, what am I good at? I'm a good communicator. What can I do? So she went into PR and then social media. Uh, Jory uh, had a safe job in publishing. And you know, she had this joke, you know, if you stay long enough in publishing, you're going to make it to the corner office because you know why? Because longevity, um, longevity wins. And she was miserable. She left her job three times, three different times, until she had the courage to leave. And then you had Elisa Camahor Page. She worked in Silicon Valley uh, during the dot-com bubble. And on a Friday, all these people were getting pink slips, and she didn't get one. And she was upset. She wanted to be fired. She was sitting, she was stewing all weekend, like, why didn't I get a darn pink slip? <laughs> and then she went into her job on Monday and said, can you please fire me? And they said, no, we like you. And she's like, but I don't want to be here anymore. So then, you know, then she realized, I've got to become a consultant. So three very, three stories we can all relate to or know somebody who's gone through it. And they created a company based on what they wanted as a consumer. Right. And now blog her is like, it's a behemoth in social media. It sure is. I mean, one of the things that uh, Jory says is, it was so powerful doing my own thing that it got to the point that the risk of not doing it outweigh, outweighed the risk of doing it. Exactly. I think we should all live by that. We definitely should. I mean, that's, that's where, you know, that, that seems to me to be the core of happiness in a career that you can't live without it. Exactly. You know, they've been trying to get rid of me here at CSIS for years, but I can't live without it. <laughs> you know. Let's go to some of your questions. Questions at the back. We have a microphone. We're going to pass it to you. My name is Nancy Berg, and actually I'm an uh, owner with three other women of a small business, and I also teach leadership at the university level. So this is very interesting, and I want to thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, if you had had all women in the book instead of mostly men, I think you just had this one trio of women, um, would you have had different lessons? And um, if you were to do another book and if it was all women, who are some of the women you would think about? Hmm. Oh, that's, that's tough. Um, I think this is your next book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny that you bring that up because I'm always asked that this is my third book and um, I had two women in my second book, which was on shipping, and then I had uh, one female in my first book um, during the financial crisis. Um, when I think of individuals, just so you know, I don't really think about gender. I think about the qualities of the leader uh, because I really, truly believe it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you can be successful. Uh, sure, women, of course, we have maybe some additional challenges. Um, in our careers with family and, and, and uh, salary and things like that. But I honestly think that the lessons learned would be identical because we're all human. I really don't think it changes. I just think it's the, the, uh, the heaviness, the weight, if you will, of our challenges that we face. But I really think, you know, bottom line, it's kind of non-gender specific in terms of the lessons. I urge you all to read the chapter about um, the women of Blogger because I, I actually found it to be, I, I, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of gender either, but yeah. some of the ideas that they put forward are, are just, you know, really fascinating. I mean, one of the rules to live by, um, uh, Lisa Stone says, confidence is the heartbeat of beauty. The trick to get, to get there, we have to fail and change. The courage to fail is irresistible to me. That's an amazing statement. Most people are so afraid of failure, don't yeah. want to go anywhere near failure. Um, when, you, when you interviewed these folks for this yeah. book, did they really live up to all these traits that they oh. put forward? I mean, I'd probably more. Absolutely, right? yeah. No, they're, they're, again, they're larger than life, and it's intoxicating to be around them because they're so passionate about what they do. They're constantly on the road. Uh, right. When I interviewed uh, Jory, she was pregnant. And uh, she was busy going from blog her, whatever year it was, mm -hmm. to the next event, going to South by Southwest, 
they're constantly on the go and they are always pushing themselves because they have to evolve, especially in social media. I mean, goodness. I mean, look, over the last course, what, the last two years, things have just exploded. So I think the, the whole thing of being relevant, as they talk about and as Ellen Mulally talked about, um, it's, it's extremely important. Uh, to them. So that's why they have to have the courage to fail. And how do they make themselves so relevant, though? I mean, very few people get to be as relevant on the scale that they are. It's because they listen to their community. Uh, the community are their, blogger, their bloggers. And it, it goes back to like the Harold Hamm thing, being the consumer. What do I want from myself? What do I have to provide for a blogger such as myself? And the key thing, too, with Blocker and their instantaneous success was corporate America realized that this is like a gold mine. All these mommy bloggers, when it comes to their products and things like that, you go to a Blocker conference, you name the brand, they are there. They are showcasing new products, they're talking to people, what works, what doesn't work. Because once you get down like on that level, you're able to get so much more information. It's more intelligence than being stuck in the corner office. And looking at numbers. And, and looking at numbers. I mean, Alan Mulally of Ford is always down on the floor. He right. knows names. He remembers people like you will not, like, it'll blow your mind. He'll meet you once and then he'll remember you a year from now. Hmm. It's, that, it's that touch. You've got to you be on that pulse. It's extraordinary. Questions? Ray. We're going to bring a microphone up front. As an aside, I try to remind my two college-aged children that manners are a competitive edge okay. in this day and age. Um, several years ago, I was asked by the media about the number of women in the Pentagon in senior positions, especially positions that are presidential appointments requiring Senate confirmation, and what has happened over the administration since 1947. So I compiled this list, and yes, now Obama has appointed more women into what we call PAS appointments than anyone else. And in my research, I began to think, why is this happening? And of course, there have been many successful women in the media uh -huh. for easily 25 or 35 years, Barbara Walters to begin with. But do you realize today in companies that we here at CSIS do research on and research uh, about and investigate and dissect the aerospace, defense, electronics industries, plural. Linda Hudson, CEO, BA, these are CEOs. Linda Hudson, BA Systems. Meg Whitman, HP. Uh, Ginny Rometty, IBM. Marilyn Hewson, Lockheed Martin. Phoebe Novakovic at, uh, at General Dynamics. Ellen Lord at, uh, at Textron Systems. And I saw what is happening. So as a kind of I'll, I'll lay out your next book. No. Uh, the idea being, are women better at this? Or have they just come into their own, yes, because of our mother's work, feminists' work, to open up more doors? Or are there, are there some gender differences with respect to how women approach management challenges and the teamwork issue that you speak to? I think it depends on the, on the female, because I work with a lot of bitches, to be quite honest. <laughs> I do. I think, I, I think Is that, that I don't know. Well, even, even when I worked on, Wall, well, I guess Wall Street, too, so there you have it with that. Yeah. I, I think sometimes very par like, powerful women, a very secure, powerful woman is not going to care if there's another powerful woman. But if you have an alpha dog or you have an aspiring alpha, that's where the cattiness can happen. That's where the backstabbing talks. So I think the leadership has to come from the top to kind of nip it. Um, I think the cattiness in the workplace kind of hurts women. Um, so you kind of have to rise above. I think that women um, were much more, I, I, at least I am, I look within a lot. And I think we take the time sometimes to take that little breath to look within to kind of go through those steps, if you will. Whereas with men, it might be a little bit more analytical. Women are more emotional, let's face it. Um, we're passionate. And when we truly believe in something, we do it. 
That's why they, you know, always say, like, uh, every, uh, behind every man is a strong woman. And, the, you know, when the guys joke, oh, I got to go home to the CEO. There's a reason for that. I mean, we, we, we do a lot. We wear many hats, and we're very strong. We're able to compartmentalize. We're able to prioritize. I'm not saying that men can't. But I think that now that you're seeing more and more women, because society is now open to the fact of more female CEOs, that we're able to kind of uh, flex our muscles, if, if you will. But I think it, it, it just depends on the leadership involved to make sure that that cattiness doesn't happen. Do you know, I was once laughed out of a room because I introduced myself to a chief executive as I'm Amy Goldberg's husband. It's great. Yeah. And the guys all standing around just broke out. And I, I didn't understand what was so funny. Yeah. But my husband says that I'm Laurie and LaRocco's husband. Right, exactly. And tell everybody who your husband is, just so they know. Um, my husband is uh, Michael Wallace. He's the morning drive anchor for WCBS 880 in New York. So, so a few people listen to him in the morning just, also. Just a couple. Yeah. We have a question right here. Yeah, you talked about uh, the interpersonal skills. Can we use the microphone? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I've enjoyed your talk very much. You've talked about the uh, people skills of the, of the folks you talked to. Did any of them give you any kind of hints in terms of interpersonal skills, in terms of emotional intelligence, in terms of reading other people? Did they give you any hints as to what they have found works particularly well for them? Well, a lot of it is getting to know the person, truly, like, really listening. How many people in this room have know that they have spoken with somebody and they know that the person has not heard a darn word that they've said? Sure. Right? They're looking around. They're trying to look for the next person who they can go talk to. Um, it's uh, folks that can really listen, ones that can connect with the person that they're talking to. And um, again, the, the basic manners of please and thank you, and even saying God bless you. You know, it's very common courtesy. And also the ability to read people, to watch the body language, and know when to go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. We have a question right here. Uh. Thank you. This is a wonderful event. Thank my you. name is Lauren Holt, and I have my own company, Holt Global Strategies, a former diplomat, and I work on trade with Asia. And one of the questions I have for you, it's a two-sided question. The first is for people who are transitioning from government to owning their own business and any advice for that. And secondarily, if you know an industry, still trying to find that niche. And how does one find that niche beyond asking questions, listening, and trying to be a problem solver? Thank you. Sure. I think making the transition from government uh, you know, over to the private sector, I think it's pretty much just very cut and dry, looking at, look within, what am I good at? looking out at the outside world and seeing the voids, like where can I contribute? What can I do in order to provide a service or become a, a, a team player in whatever organization? You have to look at the assets. It all goes back. It, like I said, it, it doesn't matter if you're public or private or if you're going to start your own business out of your home, if you were a homemaker. It all goes back to those strengths and looking at the voids. And then in terms of um, like the various niches and all that, uh, a lot of industries are constantly changing. I mean, like, for instance, look at Microsoft. I mean, they're like an ancient, ancient, ancient company. And they realize now that they've got to get along with the times. Unfortunately, they're a classic example of being too late. Mm -hmm. And they've got to, you know, now they've got a lot of ground to work up. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to constantly keep your ear down to the ground. I mean, the auto industry is doing great with innovation. Um, technology, cloud computing. Um, it's interesting to see all the little players that are in there, be it the little gadgets and doohickeys that make it all happen. I think a lot of times when you look at the next things for tomorrow, it's that innovation for those little pieces that make the larger picture. So I think that's what we're going to be seeing are, are these other players kind of blossoming out. It's fascinating. You know, and to, to your question, there's a great thing that really resonated with me in this book, and, and again, David Rubenstein, and he says, um, as Laurie quotes him, great fortunes have been made and will always be made depending on what a government does. If you take a look at the greatest investments ever made, many of these investments have taken advantage of either a legislative change 
or a regulatory change. If someone can figure out what those changes will be in advance, they'll probably do reasonably well if they pursue the right niches. So you brought up exactly, I think you and David need to get together for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a question right here. Yes. We'll bring the microphone around. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, presentation. You. My name is Ted Nozaki. I'm uh, working for part of Mitsubishi. My home country, uh, Japan, um, losing working population and uh, more and more women have to start to work. But uh, management position occupied by women is so low, probably yeah. less mm -hmm. than 10%. And uh, you mentioned about passion. Passion and uh, aggressive women. There are certain women there, but uh, including uh, my friend Toshie, frustrated because of the Japanese society organizations tend to be authoritarian. And uh, Toshie left uh, Japan 15 years ago because of some frustration, and she found a great job here. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to uh, hear from you. Uh, any advice uh, to the uh, women in Japan looking for the uh, management job, but uh, their uh, stumbling block or just pressure because of uh, men's society and authoritarian, how can those people uh, thrive and uh, get their uh, dream come true? I mean, it's going to take a lot of persistence because unfortunately, you know, the culture over there is, is not where we have here. So the opportunity. Um, is a lot harder to achieve. But I think that if you're passionate, you have a loud enough voice, if you could provide solutions that will work and you can make them known to the right people, that you will be heard. Because in the end, um, the company's going to want to be successful. And you really have to toot your own horn. I mean, even here, you have to toot your own horn. You're, you are your best advocate. And I think, especially if you're in such an environment, where they kind of pigeonhole you and keep you down. If you can just find that one person or get that word out about what you're trying to do or to kind of show that it works, I mean, maybe eventually it might work. But I think it's just that persistence and just making sure that you can get out whatever your solution is or whatever you're trying to achieve out there, um, especially in business, if you have a solution for something or a game plan. You know, get it out there because if it does work, it's another notch in your belt. We have time for one more. Right over here, sir. Michael's getting a workout today. He keeps going back and coming. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roman Zaitik from the IMF, and um, I'm fascinated with this uh, leadership issues, and uh, especially in private equity that you mentioned. One quick question is, how do the people in private equity that you met, and in other businesses as well, how do they hire people? You know, there's a lot of research about merit versus um, sort of friends or um, affinity hiring. And how do they, have you, have you talked to them, how they build these teams that they can rely on and actually deliver the results? Thank you. Well, a lot of times, like for instance with Carlisle, um, they actually have hired some of the CEOs of companies that they have taken over. Mm -hmm. um, again, they're like-minded people. They believe in the same thing. Um, they're also looking for individuals that have specialties. Uh, because as you know, with private equity, they'll go into a whole variety of different companies. So they will actually target folks that have strengths in certain industries. Um, I, I'm trying to think, like uh, I, even like Ron Barron, for instance, for, um, from Barron Capital. A lot of his uh, fund managers have had real world experience in the very industry that they are investing in. So I think the practicality that rolling up your sleeves, the real experience is what counts because, again, you can relate to it. And then you'll think like the consumer, are you going to think like, okay, how should we get this company to move from A to B? Well, when I was at a certain company, this is how we did it and it didn't work or vice versa. So I think it's that hands-on knowledge that they're looking for. The book is called Opportunity Knocking, Lessons from Business Leaders. You can find it right outside. Um, and remember that when Charlie Rose gets you, I had you first, <laughs> okay? Um, again, at Laurie Ann LaRocco, 
at H. Andrew Schwartz, at CSIS on Twitter. And this will be, uh, the, the, the video of this event will be up later on CSIS.org. So please feel free to share it with your friends. And again, you know, don't buy one book, buy two. <laughs> and let's give a big round of applause to Lori Ann. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs>